both ways. We had an event start early, we had an event start late. But I figured that way I can take you around on Mallory Square for a little walk. Yeah. Get ready? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. 
miracle I wanted to sail upon your waters Since I was three feet tall You've seen it all You've seen it all
morning, everybody, or afternoon, crack of noon, whatever time. We never know what time it is in the Conk Republic. If everybody'd like to gather around the front here as we get ready to do the ceremony, we'd like to welcome you to the 40th year of the Conk Republic. Can I have everybody say, Long live the Conk Republic! Long live the Conk Republic! I don't think Dennis, Sheila, or anybody, or Captain Finbar can, or Admiral Finbar can imagine what it was going to be like 40 years later, that we'd still be going on, still have our sense of humor, no matter what's going on in the world, we'd still be able to mitigate the world with humor. And that's really important these days because Key West is a special place, but the Conk Republic is just something like no other place in the world. And you're all a part of it. Whether you're here right now or you're somewhere else in the United States, everyone is welcome to join. Everybody is welcome. So, I'd like to get this ceremony open. Of course, one of the most important things, we have our flag, which we will raise here again today for the 40th time. We'll use that number a lot for our fund dependence. And uh, also, as we go, we're gonna sing the hymn of the Conk Republic, and so are you. So if you can look at your programs on page 39, the words are there. Normally we just have Finbar kind of singing this himself and everybody's trying to go along. And for the 40th anniversary, I think it's in due course that everybody sing nice and loud and clear. One thing about the Conk Republic is the head of our Conk Republic singing team is a rooster that you can hear in the back. So if you think you got a bad voice, you don't. He'll lead the charge and you just sing right away. So without further ado, let's do our battle hymn of the Conk Republic. And I'll bring back up Rich to play for us. I'm not sure where. It's a guy with a guitar who sings pretty, pretty damn good. And, uh, and in true, in true Conk Republic, we're, we never need to be organized. We just need to be there, and that's what counts. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, I think maybe he was having a beverage. But you know, I mean, in the Conk Republic, it's it's been that time since uh, last night. <laughs> All right, so page 39, please let's hear it nice and loud and clear. Where's Finn? Finn's song, he's got to be out the mic. <laughs>
present to the harbor, in a cutter we did spy. So we sailed up alongside her, and we took her by surprise. We hoisted up our battle flag, so proudly and so high. We went sailing on. Secretary of State for the Conf Republic, and I thank everyone for being here and being a part of the Conf Republic. Congratulations to you all for being independent of mind and frolicking in spirit. Hurrah! Huzzah! Hurrah! All right. <laughs> here we go. I'm gonna have, I have the pleasure, actually, of bringing up three very close friends of mine. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Sheila Sands. Come on up, Sheila. Where's Sheila at? Give her a round of applause. Sheila Sands from the CIA and the long history of the Conf Republic. Sheila, where are you at? There she is. Do that again. <laughs> a little lower. Okay, anyhow. Moving on. Uh, everybody knows this gentleman. Everybody, I think, if they don't know him, in the world, they know his bumper sticker. J.T. Thompson, one human family, and now we have something special announced. J.T., come on out here. Let's give J.T. a round of applause. <laughs> millions, literally millions of these stickers are all over the, all over the world extolling the virtues of Key West and, importantly, the Conk Republic. So, JT, there's something important that the community should know. You've been promoted to the rank of? Admiral. Yeah. Admiral of the Conk Republic. This is a big deal, guys. How many years, JT? How many years? Of what? In, in the Conk Republic, doing your thing, giving it away. 42 years. 42 years. Oh, my gosh, it's awesome. Great family. And... A man who knows no introduction, a uh, close friend of the city of Key West, generationally families of Key West, and one of the uh, key components in uh, establishing the Conk Republic, uh, my good friend, friend of the community, uh, Mayor Dennis Warlow. He's going to come up and give a little speech here. Uh, come on up, Dennis. 
give him a round of applause. Him and Sheila are going to give a little bit of a snippet, a snippet of the craziness that went on in 1982. So Sheila, why don't you go ahead and give us a brief uh, introduction here, and then we'll have Dennis go ahead and speak. Thanks. Well, welcome to the 40th anniversary of the Conch Republic Independent Celebration. I didn't know I was going to speak today, but I'll make it very brief. Um, my family arrived in Key West in 1825, so we've been here almost as long as uh, as anybody. So uh, Jim asked me, Jim asked me what I was doing on April 23rd, 1982, and I said I was over at the pier house doing water aerobic exercises, and I heard that there was something going on. I was in a bathing suit, and got on my bicycle, and rode over here. And I got to tell you. In those days, being called a conk was kind of derogatory, if you can believe that. But I will tell you, after Dennis got up and made his speech, I was very proud to be not only a Key Wester, but a conk. And we got to see conks with cajones that day, for those who speak Spanish. So, it was a great day, it was a great celebration, and the party just kept going. So, Dennis? I want to welcome everyone to the Conch Republic. Adam Finbaugh, great tradition. <laughs> Loved it. Uh, little history. Um, back then, uh, April 23rd, 1982, uh, things were a little bit different. The uh, Border Patrol had decided that uh, they were going to put a checkpoint up in Florida City and created like a 23 mile traffic jam all the way down to Key Largo. I started getting phone calls uh, as the mayor and uh, people wanted to know what was going on. Uh, my father was a ham radio operator. He called my house on a Sunday and uh, I didn't know. So I called the chief of police. He hadn't heard. I called the sheriff. They hadn't heard. I uh, called a good friend of mine who had a radio station, John Magliola, and uh, John said that he hadn't heard anything. Um, so by then, uh, it was getting a little hectic. Uh, by Monday, my secretary had called me, and we didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't know what they were. <laughs> but anyway, she called and said the phone's ringing off the hook, that people uh, uh wanting to know what was going on, why the traffic jam, they had cancellations. So I called, uh, which is Virginia Penico, which is the, was the uh, president of the Hotel Motel Association. And then I called uh, Ed Swift, who was president of the chamber, and uh, trying to figure out what was going on. Virginia said she was having numerous cancellations. So after that, uh, by then, by Tuesday, uh, I had uh, tried to get a hold of the state rep, and he didn't know, so my dad was pretty good friends with Congressman Dante Fussell. Uh They grew up around here in Key West, and uh, he gave me his phone number, and I called him. I asked him, and he said, I don't know, but I'll find out for you. So I figured, you know, he's congressman. I probably won't hear from him. Well, he called me back that night and told me that the Border Patrol had set up a checkpoint at Florida City and uh, he wasn't quite sure what it was about, but it might have been a budgetary item that they were trying. George W. Bush was the vice president at the time, and he was the head of it. So we, uh, I, that uh, Wednesday, I said, we have to do something because everybody was telling me when I tried to call this Admiral, uh, or Captain McKenzie, uh, McAdams, I'm sorry, of the Border Patrol, and I introduced myself and I asked him what was going on. He said, it's none of your business. I said, well, you know what? I think you just made it my business because we have gone through some economic disasters with some of the things going on with the Mariel boat lift and the Navy pulling out. So you could, you've all been down to Wall Street. You could shoot a cannon down to Wall Street and never hit anything. All the buildings were boarded up um, it was a disaster. So I called Dave Horan, who is a federal attorney down here, a very good one, by the way, to be a federal attorney. And I asked Dave if he could get us uh, a hearing at the federal courthouse, federal government, 
uh, to file an injunction because no one would give us any information what was going on. So he called me Thursday afternoon and he said, we have a hearing Friday morning in Miami between, uh, in front of a federal judge. And uh, I said, okay, maybe we should start driving up here now. He said, no, I have a plane, he's a pilot. So Dave Horan is the pilot, Ed Swift, uh, was president of the chamber. Virginia was president of the uh, hotel motel. And myself, in the plane, we flew to Miami. We went to the courthouse, and all the border patrol was there with all their brass and, and their, their attorneys, and we had Dave. So we, they, they gave all the legalese, and they went back and forth for a while. And uh, finally, I could see we weren't making a lot of progress. So I raised, I asked Dave, I said, Dave, can I ask a couple of questions? And he said, certainly. So I raised my hand, I asked the judge if it was all right if I approached the bench and made some comment. So he let me come up. In the meantime, we had picked up a copy of the Miami Herald that moment. Headlines in the Miami Herald was the uh, coming through the Miami River and uh, it was like 1,200 tons of grass and cocaine, and I forget how many uh, illegal refugees, uh, uh, illegals. So I asked the judge, I said, may I ask the Border Patrol a question? In this 25 mile traffic jam, how many illegal aliens have you caught since what I was told was after we started, was they were checking for illegal aliens and probably drugs. I said, great. They had caught five. Three Germans that had left their, water, uh, their, their passport in Homestead and two French that had left their passports at Florida City. And I said, well, can you answer one more question? How many drugs have you caught? Have you seen? He says, we've got probably about three pounds that we've confiscated. I said, well, what food? is going to stand or sit in a 23-mile traffic jam with drugs in their car, knowing they're going through a checkpoint. He looked at me and he says, Your Honor, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> so with that, I asked, how long was this checkpoint going to stay here? With this, the Admiral, the uh, Captain McAdams, and one of his assistants had this blueprint, and they put it out on the table to erect a permanent checkpoint between Florida City and the Florida Keys and Key West. Uh, that was tough to swallow. And the judge, and I'll digress before you, I, I won't go on and on and let you know about the judge. The judge looked and said at the end, he could not stop them from erecting the check checkpoint or have them take it down. However, he could stop them from creating the traffic jam. In other words, they'd have to let every fifth car go and so forth and so on. So with that, um, we're getting ready to leave. And I asked Dave Horan, the attorney, I said, Dave, did we win or lose? He says, well, look at it this way. It was like kissing your sister on the cheek, but we lost. <laughs> so I'm walking out and I've got Virginia next to me and I think Ed and Dave had already gone down and there was like a sea of reporters. Unbeknownst to us, John Magliola at the radio station had been putting out these news briefs about what was going on. And Townsend Kiefer, was with the AP and UPI and he had spread it out and therefore there were every news agency that you could think of. So we're on top of the courthouse steps and I'm looking down and here's the CIA reporter and this reporter comes up to me and he says, Mr. Mayor, now that you've lost the case, what are you gonna do? And I kind of look at Virginia and she had the original Conk Republic flag which just was the Key West flag at the time. And I said, at noon tomorrow, we're going to secede. If they're going to treat us as a foreign country, we'll become a con uh, foreign country and become the Conk Republic. So we, we leave there, 
We get in the car, nobody spoke. We get to the plane and take off and Dave decides he's going to buzz the Border Patrol while he's in the plane at the checkpoint and we're in the back and we're saying, man, you're going to get a shot out the air. So with that, Ed Swift turns and he says, Dennis, what the hell are we going to do? <laughs> I said, I don't know, but uh, I think we better quit, think quick. So that morning, uh, we had set it up right here in front of the chamber bu building uh, to do the secession at 12 o'clock that Friday. This is how fast this worked. No consultants, no engineers, none of this public relation. So this is how it was transpired. So I get a phone call about 6 o'clock. And again, we don't have cell phones. I get a call about 6 a.m. in the morning from, Cap from Admiral McKenzie who was the admiral of the base, it wasn't Coast Guard, it was Navy at the time. And he said, he and I were social buddies. And he said, Dennis, you can't bomb our ships. Yeah. I said, Admiral, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, I didn't say, and you can't lower, the, and, and the flag, you just respect the flag. I said, again, I don't know what you're talking about. So he said, in the paper, that you're gonna bomb the ships, and you're going to lower, you're going to uh, put your flag up. And I said, well, we are going to raise our flag. Uh, I said, but we'll see when we get there. I said, I'll, I'll see what's going on. About an hour later, I get a phone call from my good friend, Tony McGeer. Tony was the biplane pilot, one of the originals. He was a little eccentric, which is fine. That's us. And uh, he says, when you raise the flag, I'm going to fly over and I'm going to bomb those damn Navy ships. And I'm like, oh, Tony, you can't do that. He says, oh, yes, I can. He says, ever since I read about it, I've been up all night frying confritas and boilers. Boilers is a, a, it's almost like a hush puppy, but it's made with black eyed peas. Very, very good. And uh, I'm like, oh, my God. So with that, I get another call from the Admiral, and the Admiral says, we have the FBI, the CIA, uh, NCIS, you name it, it's going to be there. They don't know whether to arrest you, uh, laugh with you, or what to do. I said, oh boy. So we get there, and I'm up there with my wife and kids and Virginia and, and Ed and all these people. On the, on the, we had an 18 wheeler that was our platform with a small mic and a, and a small speaker. And uh, I had already told them, do not put the American flag. We're good Americans. We're not going to disrespect the flag, but we will raise ours. So with that, I had my detectives pushing my family back by the uh, entrance to the chamber. And I see Virginia go inside. Uh, she went in, she said to mix some drinks so we could relax. So <laughs> so I said, well, I asked Ed Bruce, who's one of the detectives, I said, what is going on? He says, my well, man, you've had death threats. They're going to tar and feather you and run you out of town. Your political career is over. Um, <laughs> treason they're going to charge you with. I mean, they just went on and on with us. All these things that were going to happen to me. It was a little frightening at that time. And um, so we get up on the platform and I get ready to, to raise the flag. And I'm, I'm looking around and I see at that point, uh, I believe the commissioner or mayor of Monroe County, Wilhelmina Harvey, she was out there with protest signs and people protesting what we're, what we're doing with you're going to be run out of town, you know, tar and feather you, the whole gamut of everything you could think of. And I'm looking out there at the crowd, and it was a lot of people supporting, but nobody knew really what was happening. My secretary calls the chamber. She needed to talk to me. She says, I am getting inundated with phone calls. People wanting to know what's going to happen to the money. What kind of money are we going to use? What's going to happen to their social security and have I lost my damn mind? <laughs> so 
I said, well, I probably lost my mind, but we're already here and we've got to continue. So at that time, I read my speech. We're conks. We're not going to take it anymore. If they're going to treat us as a foreign country, we're going to become a foreign country. We'll be known as a uh, conk republic. And I uh, declare myself as the prime minister of the conk republic. And all the, uh, all the attention will come to me. <laughs> so there we go. And I started reading, and I said, we will raise our flag. Uh, Claude Valdez, who designed the original flag, was our Betsy Ross of the Conk Republic. And then my, uh, my friend Joe Valdez, they start raising the flag. And I look up, and here comes the biplane coming over Mallory Square. And I'm like, oh, God, I hope he's not going to do something crazy. But sure enough, he bombed the ships. He says... Later, he says, no, I figured we could feed them to death and they wouldn't fight anymore. I said, good idea. And they did. He, he dropped a whole load of conferences on the deck. And um, at that point, I'm looking over my shoulder and I see one of my commissioners, Joe Bubble Ting, who was a local plumber. And uh, he had this loaf of Cuban bread. Cuban bread gets very brittle and hard when, it, when it's there. And he's got it over his shoulder like military style, and I said, well, he's probably just standing guard, or, you know. When we're raising the flag, I see him walk across me, and I'm like, oh my God, what's he gonna do? And it was admirals, and it wasn't the admiral from the base, but it was military with the brass, like Admiral Finbar has one. And he proceeds to walk to the front of, of the platform and hit this, this Navy guy, all in his white uniform over the head with a loaf of bread. And I declare we're at war. And about a minute later, I said, we surrender. And we asked at that point for a million dollars, but now with the interest rates, we're up to a billion dollars. And uh, so that was that's what happened. That's how come we're here today. And 40 years later, can you believe 40 years later? I can't believe this has been 40 years. And I'm still around, and they haven't tarred and feathered me. Uh, so we're still here. The checkpoint is gone. Uh, I had, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. We had the Last Chance Bar, if you've ever been by there. It's a real motorcycle place. Great place. Uh, Admiral Dry, um, Skeeter Dreyer was the proprietor. Oh, my. And he was great. He'd call me up, and he'd say, uh, they put the checkpoint back up, because they'd take it down, put it up. And he says, what do you want me to do? I said, shoot him. He says, okay. I said, no, 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 I'm kidding. Well, he had, I said, shoot him. He says, okay. I said, no, 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 I'm kidding. Well, he had this cannon, a fake cannon, that he'd light and blow up every now and then. Well, he rolls it out there, and he sets it off, and the Border Patrol is scattered. And uh, it, was, it was unbelievable. Uh, but Skeeter was a great guy. We went up there after it was all over, and, and they took the checkpoint down. And uh, myself and a couple of friends, we stopped by the Last Chance bar. And uh, I'm not a drinker. I drink a beer every I'm not a teetotaler, but I'm not a drinker. So this guy, as you know, this is a big motorcycle place, and everybody likes their beer. So I walk in, Skeeter sees me, he introduces to me, and this is big burly guy behind the bar. And I'm sitting here standing against the bar. He reaches down into my arms and picks me up and sets me on the bar. <laughs> and he says, everybody in here is going to buy a drink and whoever doesn't is out of here. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'm lucky if I drink two beers. <laughs> so anyway, we passed him around. That's how the Cock Republic started. And thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody that's involved. You all are great. Welcome to the Cock Republic. Enjoy. Let's everybody show our appreciation for the man who had the cojones to lead our country through that crisis and, and, and to demonstrate to the whole world what our values of warmth, humor, respect, and peace. What a great story. The thing is, it's true, guys. <laughs> Go ahead and tell that to your friends. 
sometimes you just have to stand up for what's right. And that's what we do in the Cock Republic every day, standing up as one human family. What we're going to do now is, we, uh, actually I want to mention a couple of dignitaries that are today, here today. We have uh, ex-county commissioner Jerry Hernandez back here. He was there back in doing something back there in 82. And of course we have our members of our military. We have the CIA over here. We have members of the Army. Give them a round of applause. Keep in mind, if you don't know what the Congress Republic does, besides have a good time, we, we do a lot of fundraising, a lot of charitable work. We're going to move on. And speaking of a dignitary, if you take a look up here, there's a there's a fellow up on a ladder. Hey, Paul, wave around your hand. I Paul, not the Speaker of the House. Give Paul a round of applause. Yeah. If, there, if, it, no, if, there, if, if there ever was a more hmm? Paul? I'm not doing it. So your fault. You know, Paul Menton was a was a key person in putting together the bicentennial here in Key West. Let's give him a round of applause for that. That was a great yeah. Actually, there's a time capsule here. Thanks, Paul. What we're going to do uh, now is we're going to do the raising of the colors. So turn your attention to Paul in the flagpole. Admiral Finbar. Left hand salute. Seven, we're going to do the pledge. Page seven in your program, guys. That was for all the Ukrainian people. Hey.